We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay, hi everyone. After this lovely video um, that I've just seen for the first time, um, I hope you all are doing well. Um, everyone who's in the room, if there is anyone, um, and on the call, we're still waiting for um, two participants. Bruna, unless Bruna's in the room. Um, if not, we can already get started as it's time. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Marlena Wisniak. I'm at the European Center for Not-for-Profit Law, a civil society organization focused on civic space and human rights. And um, today we will join a few other um, speakers that I'm really happy to present to you shortly to talk about multi-stakeholder engagement and the difficult, um, challenging, but hopefully also um, positive dynamics between civil society, private sector and government. And joining me today is my colleague, Vanya. Vanya, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, good to see you all. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, in this uh, lovely talk uh, and, and conversation. I'm Vanya Škoric from the European Center for Not for Profit Law. Um, and today we have with us Peter Maisek from Access Now. Um, Peter, quick intro. Hi all. Uh, yeah, I'm the legal director at Access Now. Uh, we're a global digital rights organization, and I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, and Paula Martins from the Association for Progressive Communications. Hello. Um, great to be with you. I'm Paula Martins. I'm policy advocacy lead at APC. APC is an organization that works in the intersections between social justice, human rights, and technology and I'm calling from Montreal. Hi, Paula. Um, Hi. And hopefully others will be joining shortly. It's always a little bit hectic um, coordinating online and offline, but we will have Bruna Martins, who is the, um, um, the um, visiting researcher, sorry, for Berlin Social Science Center and um, a researcher at Colisao Direitos Narede, and um, Alex Walden from Google, who is the global head of human rights. Hopefully, they'll be joining shortly. Unfortunately, Urvashi Aneja, executive director from Digital Futures Lab, had a medical emergency this morning, so will not be with us. But um, with that said, um, let's dive right in. And Vanya, if you could give a quick intro to what our goals today are um, and how you see the session broadly. Thank you so much, Marlena. Uh, we are here, uh, I can dare say, uh, amongst friends and colleagues, um, and uh, we want to actually address some of the challenges that have been uh, broadly discussed but uh, not yet resolved uh, across civil society. Um, uh, and namely, these are the inadequate and always problematic uh, stakeholder engagements and participation mechanisms. Um, that are currently carried out by technology companies and policymakers. And then as the um, rules and standard setting uh, keep going uh, within the technology space and digital space uh, more rapidly, um, we uh, want to address the underlying uh, issue, uh, and that is that civil society are confronted with the uh, uh, corporate capture of internet governance. And um, through this workshop, we want to at least scratch the surface to take a critical look at what this multi-stakeholder governance uh, uh, and participation should look like um, and what are some of the pitfalls uh, of multi-stakeholder engagement that we want to avoid in the future uh, governance structures. Um, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, this comes particularly um, on the uh, uh, basis of uh, understanding that a lot of um, calls are recently being um, issued to have a more robust due diligence or even human rights impact assessment 
processes embedded in the standards for uh, developing te technology and emerging technology, in particular AI. However, if these uh, uh, instruments and mechanisms are to be really meaningful and effective, the key concern is not having them become uh, you know, checkbox exercise, performative, weakened, or ineffective because of the lack of real, true, meaningful uh, engagement and participation that elevates uh, and helps civil society and affected communities. I'll stop there for the introduction. Yeah, thanks. Um, and um, I did also want to raise that we are in Poland today. Um, I'm Polish, I usually feel um, legitimate to just like criticize the fact that you know IGF, that is a multi-stakeholder initiative, is taking place in a place um, in a country that is incredibly difficult um, for LGBTQ activists to participate. So that's also something to keep in mind when we organize multi-stakeholder activities. Uh, make sure that activists from all corners of society and demographics, um, especially our trans um, and queer um, friends and family, can participate. So another. Um, challenge to keep in mind, but um, let's start off something positive. And first of all, acknowledge that multi-stakeholder participation is and should be a priority for any type of uh, policy making um, and, and, and decision making. So, so, so often civil society is left out. So before jumping into the um, challenges, um, yeah, I do want to acknowledge that we should always strive for more uh, multi-stakeholder participation and as much as possible include um, civil society orgs, activists, um, human rights defenders from all over the world. Um, we all know that there is um, inadequate representation globally. Um, so I'm happy that today we have folks from around the world and, and unfortunately Uvashi can join us from India. And let's go straight to Bruna who I think has joined now. Bruna, could you introduce yourself um, quickly? And then um, if you could talk to us a little bit about how you have generally found multi-stakeholder engagement to be effective for advancing your advocacy goals um, during your experience in civil society and also as a researcher. Um, and then, yeah, any challenges or hurdles that you've been confronted with when collaborating with actors from different sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena. And, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm in the room. The camera is just focusing on the other side. So but but I'm here and also on the online um, room with you guys. So hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> very strange um, kind of dynamic. But um, anyway, yes. Um, you look great. I, yeah, <laughs> thank you. But when we were talking about um, how multi-stakeholder like was helpful to us, um, I, I cannot um, divert from the, the Brazilian experience with the approval of our data protection bill and how Coalizão Direitos na Rede in the past year has been trying to push for more multi-stakeholder dynamics, discussions, roundtable, parliamentarian roundtables um, as part of our um, advocacy work at the Congress. So um, maybe one very good example I can bring is about the, the Brazilian data protection bill. Yeah, through a lot, through, like for many parts of that process, like we saw that the discussion was kind of like leaning towards one or the other side, sometimes the private sector, sometimes um, even like government and so on. But like at some point we managed to convince the parliamentarian who was reporting the bill that the idea was for us to have everyone on the same table, everyone in a multi-stakeholder setting of discussions. And that was, in the end of the day, that is what, and pretty much everyone in the environment in Brazil acknowledges that, that the whole multi-stakeholder compromise of having roundtables about the topics and everything else was what brought us to the final thing, the final bill and everything else. So um, to us, yeah, pushing for that is instrumental and, and has been instrumentalized a little bit through the data protection bill. And now that we are also like going through the, the fake news discussion and also in AI Act, um, what we're doing is called pretty much for the same, like let's just have everyone on the table and let's just have everyone putting their cards out loud. And just so we all understand what are the, 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 what's at stake and what's everyone aiming for um, in every single bill. So maybe I can start with that.
Thanks so much, Runa. That's really helpful and I think resonates with a lot of our experiences. Um, Vanya, do you want to go ahead and... Yeah. It would be thanks. It would be interesting to uh, hear also the uh, the perspectives from the private sector. We have uh, Alexandria Walden joining us as well. Alex, you go ahead and introduce yourselves and maybe uh, give us a glimpse of the challenges uh, uh, that you have seen and how uh, within your work you have attempted to actually address some of the challenges specific to tech companies when they try to engage with external stakeholders, especially the you know, wide uh, group of civil society. Thanks, um, and thanks for inviting me to join the conversation today. I'm Alex Walden. I lead Google's human rights work. Um, and so I have the privilege of working with many of you in civil society on issues that are important to you. And they also are important to companies and important to Google. So um, this topic is close to my heart. I come from working in civil society and I've been at Google now for about six and a half years. Um, so maybe one thing that is, I think, really important or kind of has been in a key learning for me in doing this work inside of a company um, is that I've, I have found that, and I'm sure many of you have found the same, that folks inside the company oftentimes speak a different language um, than folks outside the company. And so those of us who are responsible for making sure that um, that the most important ideas and concerns are being translated between the two parties. Um, I think we see that firsthand and those of you who engage with the companies often see that firsthand that like um, oftentimes like people sort of un are in the same place on, a, on an issue, um, but they might be kind of like literally speaking a different language sometimes. And, and it's sort of about coming from a different discipline sometimes too. So if you're talking to folks who run a product or write policies for a product or do enforcement of policies on a product, it's, it takes work and time to get to a place where um, you can trust where they're coming from and they can trust where you're coming from in order to kind of get to the root of the, what's challenging and kind of really get to honest conversation about what the problems are and what's possible and who the stakeholders are who are best equipped to solve them. And sometimes that's companies, sometimes that's civil society um, and expertise outside of companies and oftentimes the, there's a role for government. Um, and so kind of thinking about all the stakeholders in the space. Um, another kind of challenge that we are very aware of is how much companies are interested in hearing from civil society. Those of us that have a human rights program, I run a human rights program, we've made it very clear to our companies that engaging and consulting with civil society is a core um, necessity for us to be able to you know, live up to our commitments related to human rights. Um, but that requires us to engage with you and you all to engage with us. And, Certainly that means that we are asking for a lot of time and insight and engagement from civil society where we're one, not the only company that's asking you that of you. Um, and two, it just is a lot of resourcing and I think can be frustrating when companies are unable to be super clear about how your engagement or your feedback results in changes for what's happening inside of a company. Um, so those are maybe a few things I'll highlight. There are many others, but I think um, there's a lot of fodder for us to discuss related to those that I've raised. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And for sure, the different languages um, is a big issue, in, including you know, internally within companies. People come from so many different backgrounds. Um, and civil society does have their jar jargon. Um, for sure, and I think we all forget, and even when we talk with people who are outside our field, you know, some of the like stakeholder in and of itself is very jargony. What does stakeholder mean? Uh, affected group. Um, so I think like we should also definitely look at ourselves and how we speak, and if we want to be inclusive with groups who are not organized and you know formal civil society organizations, but activists on the ground, um, or folks from you know local group, local based groups who don't necessarily use the same terminology. Um, I think that's a really great point. And we should also, 
yeah, think about that within civil society. Um, and Paula, so as Alex was speaking about the challenges, um, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about what our lessons learned, you know, from your engagement in uh, multi stakeholder engagement, from your um, experience in that uh, role, and um, you know, how can we best move on going forward? And if you have any examples with the AI um, governance or you know, digital rights specifically, which is our interest here. Thank you, Malena. I think I was just <laughs> reflecting on what you were saying and thinking that maybe one of the starting problems or challenges that we have is in defining the term. What does it mean exactly, mood stakeholders? Not only in terms of who the mood stakeholders, who the stakeholders are, but also in terms of process. What does it mean in terms of what, what is the process that is needed to really have meaningful engagement in decision making? What does that mean? Because it's not only about who enters the door, who is in the room, but really how the, the final decision is influenced. So I think this is one uh, initial, initial lesson learned in a way to, that uh, we need to be more um, targeted in what we want when we talk about new stakeholders and really look at the different uh, examples that we have. And I think the examples that we have are not uh, ready to go examples. I think we need to go, uh, we need to look at different uh, things that are going on and take what is um, res having good results in different spaces. And then uh, my the, the examples that I was going to mention are not even from AI or even the digital field, because I was thinking that one thing we should be doing is to look at the environmental field and take a look at how they are framing this discussion, uh, look at the food system discussion. So look at uh, global governance more broadly and see how mood stakeholders has been advancing and what are the proposals there. And I think we need that uh, to move forward. So that that would be um, a first, uh, a first essential point in, in my view. I think the second thing that we need to recognize that there are deep power imbalances when we talk about uh, putting different stakeholders around the table. And we need to be clear and honest about that if we want to address how to manage that. So we do believe in mood stakeholderism. So what are the, again, maybe it's about processes. So what are the processes that we need to bring to ensure that uh, people will have equal participation and we create more balance. And when we talk about um, power imbalances, I was thinking that it's not only between the different stakeholder groups, but also within the same um, um, stakeholder group, because of course you have an issue of representation, and I think that as well is something that we we have learned that it's it's it, it, it from our side also from civil society if we are um, honest about it, we need to have um, a critical assessment about how. Um, what are the groups that we are not uh, successfully uh, representing and making sure that their voices are being heard. Um, and maybe some of these models that I was mentioning um, could be more interesting in, in, in looking at that, because I think um, maybe one way of bringing this um, to the equation is disaggregating a bit further the stakeholder groups. So if you look at the SDGs, for example, they talk about the major groups. So they include women, children, indigenous peoples, workers, and trade unions. So maybe if we look, if we bring something like that, uh, a more disaggregated approach, um, this could be um, um, an added value. And I have so many like points <laughs> that I wanted to say. Let me finish with just uh, one more. Um, that it's um, it's about cooperation. I think. Um, we, again, it's related to power imbalances as well, because uh, when we get into the negotiation tables, civil society in general doesn't have the same resources. So one lesson that we learned quite um, strongly is that to be heard, it's always good to work together and, uh, and identify clearly how different uh, organizations, how different actors can contribute. Um, so that we have a more coordinated, stronger um, argumentation, participation, advocacy. Um, 
and uh, and and our stakeholder group talking from like civil society can have uh, more impact in these negotiations because we know that um, both government some governments not all because as i said we also have imbalances there but uh, many governments and uh, the private sector they come with a lot of baggage so they have the resources not only in terms of like uh, people, the kind of uh, time they can dedicate to different spaces, the kind of research, the kind of data that they can bring. So I think collaboration within um, civil society is key to um, start to, 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 to balance these and, and in, ensure that uh, our contribution is um, more effective, more impactful. Thank you, uh, Paula, absolutely key points. And we'll come back to some of them definitely in the discussion later, but maybe to make it more concrete, uh, a, a question for Peter, how does this reflect and fit in uh, this whole story and challenges of multi-stakeholder engagement? How do they fit in uh, broader uh, civil society inclusion, especially in, in, in systems related to AI and internet governance in your experience so far? Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really uh, good stuff so far. And I think, you know, when we have this many civil society in a room, we'll tend to, you know, look, look more inward. I think that's okay. Um, I'm not sure I can get more concrete. I was actually going to uh, blow it up a bit. And, you know, um, I wanted to uh, bring in, you know, some thoughts from colleagues um, that we've had, that I've had recently, some talks where, you know, I was talking about what what went well this year and what we've done well in 2021. And I was saying some civil society organizing. And my colleague said, "Well, sure, yeah. You know, we're on the, we're all in this boat together, crossing the sea. We see, and you know, there's a lot of holes in this boat. The water's coming in, and we've organized well to, you know, to fill those holes and to get the water out of the boat, right? To to bail out the water. But, you know." why are we in this shoddy boat? Why are there holes in the boat? And, you know, what are we doing trying to brave these rough seas any, in the first place, right? And it's, um, it's uh, taking that opportunity to like step back and, uh, you know, say, I think, what if civil society didn't exist? And that's, that's I, that actually is a very concrete question in a lot of countries, right? There is no civil society. Another colleague this week was talking about, you know, how we're going to campaign um, in certain countries, and they said, well, you know, we're going to work with civil society. Well, actually, we're going to work with people on social media because that's what it is. That's that's the only free space left um, is on social media, and so there, you know, and that you know, for all sorts of reasons, that's that's not a great situation to have you know, the, the only free voices be um, those accessing uh, private platforms, you know, owned and uh, operated elsewhere. So, um, yeah, I, that that's one thing I wanted to get at is that even if we solve this, right, we solve the participation problem for civil society and in internet governance or in AI, you know, civil society doesn't exist in a lot of places. And I don't think we're going to get that at the higher goal, which I think we can all agree is that everyone affected by a decision or a policy or a service has is consulted in making that decision. I think that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. And civil society's um, participation is a proxy for, you know, that sort of democratic value taking root. And, um, and so, yeah, I, mean, I think uh, uh, had someone challenged me to, to do my job without saying the words human rights, and I think it'd be a good challenge for us to to argue for our you know role, seat at the table without using the word civil society or something. Um, uh, I think yeah. So again, if if that is the goal, I think um, to make sure that everyone impacted is uh, consulted, um, I would put that to you know to to companies and some of these processes. Um, the goal is not in that case to you know be able to show that you've had a robust dialogue. Um, that you know that in itself is not enough. That's um, part of the statement that Access Now made when we uh, withdrew from the partnership on AI. Um, we said, um, I do recommend. Uh, I'd love to share this statement. I, I didn't write it, I, but it's really clearly put and succinct. Says we support dialogue between stakeholders, but we did not find that partnership on AI influenced or changed the attitude of member companies 
or encourage them to respond to or consult with civil society on a systematic basis. Um, so it felt ad hoc. It felt like civil society was not setting the agenda. We were being asked to you know, uh, feedback into what was being presented. Um, and so for us, you know, the goal of, of dialogue itself was not enough to keep us in that forum. Um, the goal should also not be to improve your product or service. That, that alone is not, um, does not justify, I think, our participation. You know, get some paid focus groups or something. Um, uh, compensation is another topic I think that we could get to. But um, yeah, so let's, I think let's keep the higher goal in mind is that if this, if this product or service is going to impact people, they should be consulted. And I think that there's a strain of, of talk that's really popular at our event, RightsCon, um, about co-creation and co-design. And I think that gets to that um, you know, human rights by design, uh, bringing folks in at the earliest possible stage. Um, in, uh, that, and that is something that we have raised directly with, um, with Alex at Google on a number of projects, I think, and, and had a lot of good conversations about. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that uh, answered the question, but. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 always good to yeah try to remove yourself and um, I, I guess I would just finish by saying we don't only work where we're like 100% aligned right and we did take part in this uh, Council of Europe ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence CAHAI um, this is uh, a working group to produce I think a new treaty on AI. Um, we did participate in that um, and we also you know. Uh, joined ECNL and, and others in a uh, fairly strong statement at the end that we weren't satisfied with the outcome of that process. Um, and, uh, you know, that's on, on pretty specific reasons that um, they tried to exclude, you know, whole sets of military technologies um, from, uh, from the scope of this treaty, which you know, we think, you know, uh, isn't isn't appropriate, but as to say, we did we did you know participate throughout, um, and uh, you know the point is that you know we need to see as as I think Alex did make clear uh, some results, some feedback, some positive feedback showing that we aren't just delivering into a black box. We're not just trying. We're not just there to um, read a script and and make um, make this stage come alive. We actually want to be the ones writing the script and and directing uh, alongside the others. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pete, for those strong words. And um, definitely, I think resonates with a lot of us in this room. And that was really the goal of the session today. So, before we open up for discussion um, with everyone. The, the 15 souls who are part of this call. Um, I do want to highlight a few points you made um, on you know, the importance of result and not only um, pro inclusion as a process. So oftentimes because there's such an imbalance of power, um, we, we almost overly focus and definitely ECNL, um, that's a, a role focusing on civic space on participation itself. But that only that should not be the goal, right? It's like you said, it's actually to change things and having decision-making power. And a lot of our work recently has been on human rights impact assessments as well. And uh, when we talk about human rights due diligence, for example, with the private sector, um, and I'm sure Alex has a lot of experience on that. And, um, it, you know, conducting human rights due diligence and conducting human rights impact assessment is something that we advocate for a lot because oftentimes we're not even there. But then what, right? You can conduct an HRIA, and if ultimately there is no change, um, and people's advice, concerns um, are not actually acted upon, then, you know, at best it's useless. At worst, it actually legitimates dangerous products under the you know, stamp of approval of human rights, um, human rights approved. And um, I was at the Partnership on AI overseeing the civil society portfolio. I was gone shortly before Access Now left, but um, clearly, you know, that was an example where at the surface, um, all parties, so it was academia, private sector, and civil society were equal. But in reality, you know, the, the realities of honestly capitalism and zooming out like our economic system today um, are very real. The fact that companies are ultimately profit driven is a reality. And that's not, you know, depending on your ideological and um, economic perspectives, not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that sometimes we forget to acknowledge that 
companies and governments do have agendas. Um, and especially in the tech world, um, I live in San Francisco where in Silicon Valley, everything is mission driven. Um, you know, this kind of dilutes the, um, the different priorities under the name of, you know, we are all human rights and ultimately there are no results. So um, <laughs> to, not to make this very daunting, but we do have a lot of really um, interesting and great and inspiring people in the room and we'd love to make it a little bit more interactive. Unfortunately, we, unfortunately we're not all in person, but uh, Bruna can somewhat moderate on the ground and we are here online. Um, and um, Paula segued a little bit into Zoom and to um, thinking back about what does meaningful stakeholder engagement mean? We often throw around that term. Um, meaningful is a little bit of a catch all word that doesn't actually um, yeah, translate and practice something. And we don't even really know what it means. So I would like to just open up the floor. Um, we're a small group. Uh, many of us know each other. So feel free to you know, be open and candid and just raise your hands. Um, or shout out if you're on the ground. I think I saw David Green in the audience. <laughs> so um, definitely putting you on the spot there if that is you. Um, and yeah, just share some thoughts about uh, what meaningful stakeholder engagement participation means to you. I think David, it's gonna come in. Okay, so I can, um, hi. Um, sorry, you're all not here. Um, so um, I, I, you know, I agree with everything that's been said. We, we've been talking about this a lot at just at lunch today, and I, I think for my part, I, you know, when I'm trying to make the judgment whether my per, whether it's a, a good use of my time personally to engage in one of these processes, um, I really want to know what the what the expectations are. Um, because I agree, what I don't want to do is what, what I find to be a waste of time and what seems to me to be the most token participation is something that purports to be a collaborative consensus building decision making process, but really is it and never was intended to be it is really it what is it's really someone who's who has the power to make a decision, whether that's a state actor or a company, they're not going to cede that power. They're going to make the decision that they want to make. <clears throat> what they want from us is something, but the, if it's not clear what it is, if, it, if it's some type of iterative consultation process, if it's expertise, that's fine. But so often all they want from us is just the opportunity to say, we've consulted with them. And then that's where, and that's where it ends. And that's, that's frustrating um, and it's a waste of time. At the same time, I find it actually be worthwhile to be involved in ones we're going in. I know that it's just a consultative process and that our expertise is valued. It's going to be listened to. It might not change their decision, but we also preserve the ability at the end of the process to say, we disagree with the decision. This was our input. Our input wasn't considered or was, or was discounted. And so I'm okay with doing that as long as it's clear to all the participants ahead of time that that was the expectation that we're not, I, I, I really try and run from the you know ones that purport to be consensus building, where it's very clear that that um, consensus isn't really a value or even really appropriate um, in that term. The other point I want to make, which I think was alluded to earlier, is that um, when we as civil society can't represent everybody, we can't you know I mean, when EFF gets invited to an event, we we try and you know stand in the shoes of internet users, but many times of a far more specialized expertise is needed. And one of the roles I think we often end up playing is, is trying to tell who's missing from the room. Um, and I don't know how many multi-stakeholder things I've been in recently where we've said, you know, why aren't the sex work advocates here? That seems to be the, be the absolute most affected stakeholder and you haven't even talked to them. And we can't, you know, I, I can't, I can't speak for them as well as they can speak for themselves. So I think it's, um, also, uh, there's a limit of, of, of our proxy ability, um, and sometimes I think we're asked to represent a greater universe of interest than we are able to. I think we have two more hands here, Marlena, um, both from Colin and Courtney. Sorry, it might be that uh, we're kind of hive minded because we just had, uh, I talked about this a little bit at lunch. I'm Colin Curry. I'm formerly civil society, but now a, an independent regulator at Ofcom in the UK. Um, and I actually, something that Peter said actually resonated with me as well about trying to 
speak about civil society without saying civil society, because I think oftentimes in internet governance spaces, we think about civil society in a certain way, but something that's really struck me about uh, moving into a more policy function, a policy making function is the incredible diversity of civil society within even just within the UK. So everything from, you know, the epilepsy society to the Church of England to the kind of child rights or human rights or privacy. And it's just this spectacular range of expertise and interest groups. Um, so I think that obviously coming from a, a kind of human rights background, it's easy for me to contextualize that within a kind of human rights lens or framework. But I would ask you guys, how, how do you think about this? And David's point about, uh, about proxies was, a, was an interesting one. Um, what, what does meaningful engagement within civil society look like? And how do we kind of um, surface the diversity of these interests and potentially begin not necessarily reconciling the, them, but um, coexisting in within this diverse landscape that I think is so often flattened down to just being one or two interests as opposed to, you know, 360 degrees of perspectives. Thanks. And we have Courtney now. Um, thanks. I think this is a really critical conversation and I wasn't part of that lunch discussion, um, but nonetheless, um, related to this, uh, you kind of alluded to this, Peter, but the issue of compensation, we are asked to consult for the richest companies in the world, many trillion dollar companies, including Google and Facebook on a regular basis. They occasionally um, pay for those services, but there is a challenge about taking money and then being perceived as um, somehow then bound to those interests. A lot of NGOs are trying to figure out, should they take that money or not? But why should we subsidize um, these companies to do these consultations with civil society when you know civil society spaces are closing and struggling for economic viability? Also, I'd like to ask Peter about RightsCon, because as there is the you know civil society whitewashing of these initiatives, can we legitimately invite companies like Facebook to enter our spaces of civil society that are devoted to human rights when it's just so obvious that year after year after year, they are violating our human rights on a regular and systematic basis, hiding the research, and aren't they using our venues as a way of whitewashing their own human rights abuses? At what point do we deny them access to those spaces? Thank you. Back to you, Marlena. Actually, uh, I'll hand the mic to Vanya for a few minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I have to say, these are exactly the questions that we are uh, working on, um, and, and many of us are, are working on. Um, for example, um, we have started, I'll, I'll give you just a glimpse of how, the, how similar are uh, the issues uh, because we have just embarked a couple of months ago uh, with MOSFEST uh, to lead the working group uh, on trustworthy AI, one of the working groups on trustworthy AI uh, on uh, meaningful civil society engagement in human rights impact assessments. And this is exactly the frame that we are trying to unpack. So we work through three phases and then phase one is actually identifying what do we want from participation? What does meaningfully engage really mean to me? What does it need to exist to be meaningful? Then the phase two is why can't we have it? What are the obstacles and challenges? And we are currently in that phase, gauging the input from uh, different stakeholders, civil society, tech companies uh, on, on challenges. And many of these, I, I think all of them have been mentioned here, uh, but there are many more uh, in the document that I'll share with you uh, in just a moment. And then in phase three, uh, which is in the next couple of months is then, okay, how do we then design the process and put our um, almost like a, a list of conditions uh, that will uh, address those challenges and obstacles and actually uh, put the stake of civil society in the meaningful. Uh, so what do we want, what do we need uh, for all of these uh, processes uh, to actually be meaningful? Um, all of these issues have been mentioned from uh, power imbalance, uh, extraction. Uh, we have also uh, uh, discussed issues of uh, educating and translating 
to those most affected uh, because uh, CSOs as proxies might be more technical and more closer to resources, so to speak, than actually uh, those communities uh, that never get engaged. Safety concerns were also discussed, building trust, um, uh, and then actually having the uh, influence, uh, as most of you mentioned, having the influence over the decision. So what is the real expectations uh, uh, of the process and how do we really have uh, how do we really know that uh, there will be um, a, an influence over the result? Um, we are in this process um, missing a lot of voices from the tech community, I would say. So maybe I can uh, turn the floor back to Alex and ask how do they deal with some of these questions? And are there any good ways to share uh, how to address some of these concerns? And I'll share the link to the document that we are currently working on where we are collecting different challenges. And you can see in different tables, uh, different sub questions, what we are looking at, but most of it is mentioned here. You'll be able to recognize. Um, these are, I feel like all of the, I have something to say um, about all of the issues that have been raised in the past 10 minutes, um, but maybe, where I'll start is that um, I think companies in general, and obviously inside the company is not a monolith. And so there are lots of interests um, that civil society stakeholder groups and even people who work at companies are trying to speak to within a company. Um, but just to say that I think companies are, there are a subset of companies that are learning and trying to do it better and are welcoming of advice on how to improve and how to right size and format engagement in a way that is um, feels meaningful to everyone who is engaged. Um, and so I think something that I try to do um, in Google's engagements to David's point is to make sure that it's clear if we're doing a consultation and I make clear to my colleagues when they say they wanna consult civil society and I say, are we consulting or are we briefing? because I do think it's important to brief as well, but one of those is a conversation where we're asking for input at a moment in the process where we could make changes if we are made aware of concerns that we have not already addressed, right? Or of, of new angles on the concerns that, that are coming up related to what we're doing versus like, helping everyone understand a decision that we've made, a thing that we're launching, a policy that's changing, et cetera. Both things are important. One is more about transparency and one is more about consultation and um, bringing in expertise from stakeholders that are outside of the company. Um, so that to me, it's sort of like that level of clarity and transparency in the engagement, I think is something that is really important. I think we try to do and could certainly improve and that all companies should get better at so that everyone can have more information about whether or not they should engage and what the benefits are for them. Um, in using their time to engage with companies. Um, another, like a thing that I think companies can do better, and I think we, you can see that from a handful of us, certainly Google, is that in spaces where it's just government and companies, we spend a lot of time um, reminding government that civil society should be in the conversation. And so I think that is one benefit of what at least some of the tech companies have been doing is reiterating that it is important that it is not just companies and governments having conversations about regulation of digital spaces, about the future of the internet, about any kind of subject matter um, under discussion, but that there are many impacted stakeholders that have expertise um, to bring to the table and to be part of the conversation and, um, and creating the kind of directional path. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I, there are a lot of ways in which consultation and engagement happens. And so that's sort of like where, where it's government. And then I think I spoke a little bit about where um, we're talking about consulting with civil society related to our products and policies. Um, but I do think Anyway, I think the, the last thing I'll say is just that I think telling us how you want us to do it is useful because one of the things that I see happen at companies because they're big is it takes a long time for companies to understand that they 
you know, I think I've seen over the past decade, companies, maybe like seven years or so, companies kind of understand that they should be consulting with civil society. And so now they understand it. <laughs> and they're sort of like, oh, we need to talk to everyone. And so then there's kind of this proliferation of like, let's have conversation. Sometimes it's consultation, sometimes it's briefing, sometimes it's other, but like, there's a lot of that. Um, that's not focused on the things that we've just talked about. And so now we like we have all as a community convinced companies that they should be talking to civil society and they're doing it in a kind of messy way, right? And so I think now we have to get companies to all, don't have to, but it would be useful to get companies to understand actually like what does right-sizing that engagement look like? How do you want to hear from us and what do you want to see from us? Um, so I think there is a lot of power in um, the sort of civil society intermediaries that are able to communicate that. And I recognize that's different from activists on the ground. Just and so on that last point, which has come up, sort of like the difference between larger intermediary civil society groups versus those who are on the ground and activists, companies are gonna continue to struggle to get to the that category of folks. I think we are, the sort of the the jargon barrier and the um, framework barriers that exist are and in addition to the kind of scale and speed at which we're working, I think are always going to make that difficult. And so it's useful when folks like I, Peter's in the middle of my screen, so I'll just call it Access Now. If a group like Access Now tells us we need to be speaking to X Y Z group on the ground in a particular country, we will take their advice on that. But absent sort of like talking to a grass tops group, I think it that's that's the way it it's going to happen for companies. Um, so I think that's another piece that there's room for improvement, but also um, kind of just getting clarity about the way that it will probably be operationalized at companies. Thank you, Alex. This, this actually reminded me of one important point that uh, also we as civil society need to uh, look at, uh, which is you know, trying to uh, help our colleagues come on board as well, which is something that we at ECNL try to do so in this space, especially in this very highly technically jargoned digital conversation and space. We try to bring in, first we try to provide some education, but then also bring in smaller groups grassroots groups, you know, disadvantaged groups and, and, and or, or those that work really with marginalized uh, and vulnerable communities to come into their into this space, we, you know, yield our speaking slot for them and then help them, you know, uh, deliver uh, a, a very, uh, you know, important points from their work, because we do feel that it is kind of our, you know, almost inherent obligation to, to help uh, our colleagues from civil society, from smaller groups or, or with less resources to come on board in these conversations. So th thank you for, for mentioning that. Can I add something about that, Fanja? I was thinking that um, it's also like part of how we have our own internal decision-making, how we produce and frame our own policies. So we also can have participation there. And it's not only about um, opening the spaces for other groups, sometimes seeding the space for other groups, but also when we put together our own policies, are we doing this kind of consultation? Are we listening? Are we collecting from the ground? Um, APC is a network and we are always like our members are always calling attention <laughs> to the fact that, okay, like before you say that publicly, let's have a meeting, let me bring what's going on here in Uganda, here in, in, um, in Chile, and, and then let's, let's put something together. So I think it's also about not, not letting this happen at the end, but really uh, at the beginning when we are forming our positions in relation to, to different uh, matters. Can I also add something? Yeah, no, just about this whole collaboration as well that Paula were speaking before and some of us as well. Um, sometimes as, as you guys were saying, like as Alex was saying, sometimes the other way around also happens. Like sometimes it's the case that civil society needs to also bring um, private sector to the table because like as we are seeing like some 
regulatory movements and some like more incisive position of like congresses, legislators, and elsewhere, like over um, you guys and your product and everything else, we're also seeing some sort of a shutdown of like conversation from the policy space to you and, and which is at least what we saw last year in Brazil in the whole um, disinformation um, bill. Like sometimes we would have like civil society would, would, would have to remind legislators that well, maybe talking to WhatsApp might be interesting to understand what encryption is because it's, it's like, it's no use just like willing to regulate them without like talking to anyone. So one hand washes the other and the, as Brazilians would say in the end of the day and like, this cooperation can also work in both ways. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, just plus one on that. I think like the cybersecurity discussions at the UN, for example, have, have really been greatly supported, helped by the presence of, of private sector technologists, um, for example, and uh, to bring clarity and, and educate and inform. Um, yeah, and I, I agree generally we're, we're past the awareness stage. Uh, you know, on in a number of ways in this um, tech and human rights discussion. Um, and, and we are getting to the how, which is a good place to be. Uh, just want to acknowledge that. Um, and, and that shows up the UN across um, the UN as well that, you know, and nobody's ignoring digital um, and tech anymore. It's more a question of how. I did want to answer, uh, yeah, or uh, respond to Courtney's great questions. Um, yeah, on, on funding and compensation, um, you know, different uh, different organizations are going to have different policies. Um, you know, and uh, and individuals, you know, as well. Um, you know, and it's a, it's it's never it's not clear cut for anyone. I think um, when it comes to RightsCon, RightsCon can't exist without um, a whole lot of funding, and you know, it needs to come from somewhere. And we tried to diversify the pool of funders as much as possible. Um, but RightsCon also, you know, and I think um, you know, we try to be clear about this, is more about participation. It's a Big Ten event. And, um, you know, even more than the money, we do want companies to come openly and cleanly to the table. Um, so we need their participation, but we, we do take steps um, to, uh, to shape that, the, the, uh, to shape that participation uh, to sometimes are strict who's there and, and how they participate. We don't have keynotes and things like that. Um, it's, it, but it's an evolving thing. And there are deep discussions in the team um, about certain companies and about, uh, you know, what the uh, nature of the event is and, uh, and, you know, how we keep our community safe and open um, and, and uh, yeah, really welcome input on that um, always. Uh, and then, yeah, just to go back to the language thing, I think, you know, uh, I totally agree uh, that we don't always speak the same language. I think if you look at uh, Facebook, you know, they changed who they are, I guess. Um, you know, there's this whole new company now that we're all trying to learn how to how to speak to. So it's, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's constant. There's going to be new products, new technologies and services um, to have some sort of grounded discussion, uh, you know, needs that clarity. Um, and uh, maybe it's maybe it's academia that can help bring that. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, also, following on compensation, that's something we've been thinking a lot about at ECNL. As Vanya said, um, we work mainly with smaller orgs um, and non-digital rights orgs, so uh, those focusing on social justice, racial justice, um, economic justice, basically not from, a, not from a digital rights perspective. And one way that we deal with this is like every time we you know, apply for funding, we try to make it at the core of our funding proposal from um, you know, philanthropy organizations, um, which have their own issues, uh, but um, not only stakeholder engagement within civil society, but also um, trainings, education, and give them subgrants so that they can cover their own costs. Um, you know, unsurprising, these are very low amounts. We can barely cover our own staff's um, salaries. So it's, we're talking about very small amounts of money. And, and compensation is, you know, always kind of a hard topic because we don't take money from companies for obvious independence reasons. But like we've spoken here, um, you know, maybe we should. And definitely if, if, not, if not ECNL, because we are an international NGO that has sufficient funding and, and relationships with funders, the smaller ones on the ground is a different story. Um, and then also on the training side of it, um, 
you know, it's not but with one, con one session or one call that you will be able to train someone who has spent their entire life working on um, environmental justice, for example, and how, you know, AI emerging tech or even things like, you know, surveillance technology that isn't new, like Pegasus or other types of spyware malware um, happen. So this takes a lot of time and time means money. Um, so really questions that are key here. And just also um, follow up on Alex's point who said that we as companies want civil society to tell us what they need. Um, and that's pretty much what we've been working uh, with, on with Vanya and many um, stakeholders, some of you here as well, I think, on uh, the MOSFEST project where ultimately we're trying to come with not a 10 commandments type thing, but a fairly like short, um, statement then um, activists, especially those that aren't as well connected, can use when they get to the table and say, here you go, these are our terms and conditions for actually participating in it. And it may include things like you know compensation or requesting that companies spend an extra couple of hours actually training um, people so that when they get to the table, they have more um, knowledge and background. Um, also, you know, what about sharing information resources? So Peter mentioned before partnership on AI or other types of multi-stakeholder organizations like um, Global Network Initiative. One of the main goals there are to actually access information, um, but that's obviously limited as well, given confidentiality, trade secrets, patents, um, and how do we also make sure that IP, for example, is not used as an excuse to not share information. Um, and also recognizing that companies are, have competition, so they don't share information among each other as well, right? So when we think about multi-stakeholder engagement, if we have, you know, civil society is not a monolith, private sector is not a monolith either. Um, how do groups engage with, it's different working with, you know, Google or Facebook than with let's say Slack, um, although Slack now has been bought by Microsoft, so maybe it's the same thing. But anyways, um, all these dynamics also color the way the engagement works. Um, and I see that Laura has her hand up. Um, go ahead and hi, it's nice to see you. Hi, really nice to see you. And nice to see you, Vanya, again today. We're hi again. <laughs> meeting earlier. Uh, it's been fascinating hearing this, this conversation and the perspective from civil society organizations um, I personally work at the OECD, where we developed together with my team the OECD Policy Observatory, and it is really a platform for not only policymakers but really for everyone to share resources. And now that you brought that uh, about how to to interact and share resources and make them more available and bring visibility to to different actors, um, I was just thinking, just kind of brainstorming uh, what what could be ways for for leveraging this kind of multi-stakeholder tool. Uh, for 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 the purposes of of civil society organizations working in, in AI, um, so just more um, uh, an open invitation to interact. Of course, we also have the OECD network of experts, to which Vanya is a, a, a now a member of the of the working group for trustworthy AI. And the idea there is to to do all the thinking about tools for trustworthy AI, classification systems for AI systems, and that hopefully help inform risk management and risk assessment um, of AI systems. So, so it's really a lot of thinking that is going on, a lot of data available and policy available, but how can we bring much more participation and, and, and ideally for others to leverage this tool globally? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Laura. Uh, absolutely relevant questions. Uh, we will get kicked out, I think, in two minutes uh, by the new video uh, <laughs> that is announcing the new session. So we'll just wrap up shortly uh, by actually thanking all of you for, for raising these important issues and questions. And I'm actually glad to see that a lot of questions are converging in many different fora, uh, which means that we are on the right track uh, with the questions we just need to try and focus more on answers. And we did touch upon uh, some of the good examples or some of the wishful examples, what we want to see uh, more in the future. So we'll be expanding this conversation uh, also through our most fast working group uh, that I, I put in the chat, uh, but through other uh, forums as well. And we invite you all to join in. Uh, 
uh, we will drop the summary of the session and make it public and uh, hopefully uh, organizers will be able to share uh, with all of you as well. Marlena, any final thoughts? No, um, we're at times so we'll be kicked out. I just shared with you all a recent report um, that was just published last week with Data and Society. Um, a lot of the research is on civil society participation watching and with concrete recommendations for human rights impact assessments. One is on Council of Europe CAHAI, what uh, Peter mentioned before. The other is the EU AI Act. Um, and this is kind of, um, you know, it will become a much bigger thing mass fest. So please join. I also dropped in the chat our emails. Um, it's marlena at ecnl.org and vanya at ecnl.org. So please reach out. Um, many of you on this call actually, <laughs> we regularly chat with, so you all have our info. Already for the other new friends, it's really great to meet and thanks so much for joining us, wherever you are in the world. Um, next year, it's gonna be Ethiopia, which ranges a lot of issues for civic space as well. Um, whole other conversation, but yeah, uh, if anyone's in Poland, good luck with the cold and the snow, eat some pierogi, not too much vodka. Um, and I we will see you soon. Happy IGF. And thank you for the physical audience as well. It was lovely to see you. Yeah. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Oh.